Lots to cover this evening. I want to get right to it. Recently, a group of at least 51 theologians, academics, and clergy issued a 20-page open letter imploring the bishops of the world to admonish Pope Francis for what they describe as the canonical delict of heresy. Who are the signatories? What are they charging? And what do they hope to achieve? Joining me now with analysis is Jesuit priest and founder and editor of Ignatius Press, Father Joseph Fessio. He joins us from his offices in San Francisco. Father Fessio, thank you for being here. Sure, you're right. now, good to see you. 50 plus Catholics, including prominent theologian and author Father Aidan Nichols, have published this open letter accusing the Pope of heresy. How much credibility do these signatories have? Many in the audience won't even know who they are. Uh, fill us in, Father. Well, that's true, Raymond. Uh, actually, this is not the only letter like this has been issued. Uh, back in July of 2016, 45 theologians and clergymen uh, wrote a letter that had uh, eight propositions which they thought should be condemned and made by Pope Francis. And then in September of 2016, we had the dubia uh, by right. the Cardinals, five questions. And in December, two very well-known theologians, Germain Grisey and John Finnis, said that their concern was precisely that what Pope Francis had said in Amoris Laetitia and elsewhere would be misinterpreted and used for wrong purposes. So now this particular statement comes out. You asked about the credibility. Right. Well, there, there, there's no really world-class theologians that are there as far as I can see, except for Aidan Nichols, who definitely is a renowned, serious theologian. Mm -hmm. However, you know, even people who aren't world-class or people who are simply hypercritical can sometimes say something worthwhile. Mm. So I think we have to look at the document itself. Uh, there, as you know, there are seven statements. Yeah, which Father, let me get into those. I'm going to share those with the audience just so they have a little uh, sense of what's right. being proposed here. Right. Uh, the letter goes through, as Father said, seven areas of Catholic teaching which the signatories believe Pope Francis has deviated from, okay, contradicting divinely revealed truth in their terminology. Among the things they charge, one, a Christian believer can have full knowledge of a divine law and voluntarily choose to break it in a serious manner, but not be in a state of mortal sin as a result of that action. Two, uh, they say conscience can truly and rightly judge that sexual acts between persons who have contradicted a civil marriage with each other, although one or other of them is sacramentally married to another person, can sometimes be morally right or requested or even commanded by God. They also charge that the Pope in his teaching is claiming that it's false that only sexual acts that are good are those uh, between a husband and a wife. And then they finally they say uh, God not only permits but positively wills the pluralism and diversity of religions, both Christian and non-Christian. Of course, that's a reference to something the Pope said when he was vi visiting the Middle East uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the letter highlights what the signatories believe to be problematic passages of Amoris Laetitia, Father. Um, they reference a number of bishops and cardinals and priests whom they claim are themselves heretical. And the Pope has appointed or allowed them to remain in office. Now, I get the upsetment with all of this. We've covered this for years now. But is this heresy? And is this the proper vehicle to bring these critiques forward? Uh, the question is exactly that, Raymond. <clears throat> is what the Pope has said heretical? They cite the Pope, especially Morris Laetitia, and they interpret it in such a way uh, that it would be heretical. And then they look at what the Pope has done with respect to these other bishops, priests, and cardinals, whom we supported, and so on, to show that that confirms their suspicion or their claim that the proper interpretation of these statements of Pope Francis are heretical, okay. is heretical. So that, that's, the, that's the question. I want to read one thing quickly, Raymond, yeah. from Ignatius' Book of the Exercises, uh, which, of course, uh, the Pope would be well familiar with. Mm -hmm. Ignatius, at the very beginning, says, every good Christian ought to be more willing to give a good interpretation to the statement of another than to condemn it as false. Now, that applies especially to the Pope. We have to try and put the best interpretation we can. However, it also applies to this letter. We have to try and give them the best interpretation. Ignatius goes on to say, if he cannot give a good interpretation to this statement, he should ask the other 
how he understands it, and if he's in error, to correct him with charity. So I think both sides in this thing, those who have questioned what the Pope says is possibly heretical, and the Pope himself have to be looked at. Mm. But uh, here, here's the thing, Raymond, which is critical for me. Yeah. Uh, the, the statements that are made in this letter are carefully made by people who are intelligent, and there is a plausibility to the interpretation they give to more mm. teach you. Mm. I think it's important that someone representing the Pope or on behalf of the Pope make it clear why this heretical interpretation is not the correct one, why, in fact, we must interpret mm -hmm. the more Laetitia with tradition. Um, critics of this letter, like Father Thomas Petri, who's been, who's been on this show before, he's here at the Dominican House of Studies, he, uh, uh, he, he writes the following. He says, I'm disappointed that a group of theologians, some of whom I admire, chose to express themselves by contributing to a letter calling the Pope a heretic. Their, their citations of him can be all interpreted in a way that gives the Holy Father the benefit of the doubt, which we owe him. This is what you're saying. But most importantly, he goes on, no ecclesial authority is competent to judge a reigning pope guilty of a canonical delict of heresy. In fact, I suspect canons 1372 and 1373 will be invoked here. I pray these esteemed scholars will recant and find a better way to express their concerns. As you know, Father Fessio, those canons prohibit uh, uh, calling the Pope a heretic, essentially, and there are canonical penalties associated with doing so. Well, that's another question, Raymond, and I'm not a canon. You asked Father Murray about that, or maybe Ed Peters. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do, in the letter, bring up that issue, and they do cite some very important traditional sources saying that, no, they as theologians can't criticize, you know, can't condemn a Pope of heresy, but the bishops have a responsibility to make it clear whether or not to have the Pope make it clear why his statements are not heretical. Mm -hmm. and, and if they are, if the Pope resists doing that, then the bishops have some role, and again, I'm not a canonist here, uh, yeah. but to, to do something. Well, the canon reads, I'm going to read it to you, canon 1372, we'll put it on screen. A person who appeals from an act of the Roman pontiff to an ecumenical council or to the College of Bishops is to be punished with a censure. Then going on, 1373, canon. A person who publicly incites his or her subjects to hatred or animosity against the apostolic see or the ordinary because of some act of ecclesiastical authority or ministry or who provokes the subjects of disobedience against them is to be punished by interdict or other just penalties. Do you think those canons might be invoked? And, well, you, sure and, and, and could I'm, this letter even be acknowledged by anybody in the Vatican? Do you think they'll acknowledge it? Well, that's a very good question, Rune, because... I think we have to give the best interpretation to all sides in this. And the point is, there are people who may be misinterpreting how canon law should be applied, mm -hmm. but who are very concerned about ambiguity. Certainly, no one in his right mind can deny that there's ambiguity, nor that people are using what the Pope has said mm -hmm. to support to positions which are false or heretical or contradictions. Mm -hmm. So there is confusion. I mean, anybody who says yeah. not confused is confused. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, Father, we've seen, you mentioned it earlier, there was the dubia. We had four cardinals asking questions formally of the Pope to clarify. And, again, this is all around Amoris Laetitia. Then you had a filial correction that came out. Father Thomas Weinardi, who said that the Pope, uh, uh, the, 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 he's censoring and even mocking critics. Uh, Weinandy, Father Thomas Weinandy. Uh, and then you had the Vigano testimony. I mean, this is on and on and on. Will, what is different this time? And might framing it as a charge of heresy repel the Pope and, and, and those around him to just say, you know, these people aren't to be taken seriously, since they wouldn't even respond to the other charges? It, it might, except for the fact that the clarity and substantiveness of it, this letter are something which I think require a response. It just, it's a human thing. As Mark Brumley, my colleague here at Ignatius Press, said so well this morning, the Pope should perhaps think of hiring Catholic answers, because <laughs> when they're asked questions, they give answers. You know, and I, th I think we need that. But they can't remove a Pope. This is the other thing. They're appealing to the bishops, but I don't understand what the bishops are going to do. Are they just going to say, uh, Holy Father, you need to clarify this, you're wrong? 
there's no there's no mechanism to force the pope to resign or to evict the pope. You just can't do it. Well, I mean, what if a pope should uh, decide to get married and become a Muslim? Would he cease to be pope? Well, I I I don't uh, know. Uh, that would have to go well, to a okay. theologian and a canon lawyer. But <laughs> okay. So the point is, if if there are significant bishops who can just have a dialogue with the Pope and make it clear that the Pope does interpret these things heretically and knows he interprets them heretically, then they're not deposing him. He's by himself abdicating the office. I think that's the, the, the logic behind this. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm yeah. just saying that uh, what do you do? I mean, what do you do? I mean, do, do? Do we say that because of the Holy Spirit's protection, a Pope could never formally become a heretic? Is that? That's not part of Scripture. So that can be that can be debated. Mm -hmm. So what happens if if a pope does become a formal heretic? What happens? Yeah, it's just it's very. I just think it's very dangerous territory here. Uh, it's one thing to say, Holy Father, in charity, we think you may have erred here in your expression, and will you clarify? Which is what all these other efforts attempted to do. But now, when you have a group saying, you're a heretic, and you know you should resign, that's a very different posture. And I, 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 I am concerned that the average or the common man looking into this goes, w what's going on here? That's true. But what about the common man looking at the bishops of Germany and what's going on in right. Germany saying, if there's a pope approve of that? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I guess everything's OK, right? They're, they're, uh -oh. they're... No, it's a mess. I agree. I agree with it. It's a, it's a mess. I just I'm not sure of this vehicle f to, to promote change for the good. I'm just not sure. Given the record that I just cited and the lack of response, I don't think we're going to hear anything from the Vatican about this this uh, this letter. I you think, think it's going to be utterly if I, if I wrote your superiors and accused you of being a heretic and said you should be uh, removed, what would you do? Well, uh, I, I have superiors. The Pope doesn't. The Pope has no superior except God and Jesus mm -hmm. himself. Well, so well, I guess we appeal right. to them in the, in the meantime. Okay, I want to move on to one thing. I've got to show this to you. Uh, okay. there, there is a draft that has been leaked, and this is about curial reform in the Vatican, reforming the offices in the Vatican. This alleged draft creates a new dicastery, that's a new office, uh, for evangelization by combining the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples and the Council for the New Evangelization, and subordinate to that will be the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. What do you make of this, putting evangelization above doctrine? Well, if you might put it above, uh, you know, in, a, in an organizational chart, but you can't separate doctrine from evangel. What, what are you going to be evangelizing about? You're right. preaching the truth, right? So, I, you know, I think Thomas uh, Reese's article in National Catholic Reporter Online was quite good in many ways. I agree with uh, you. Yeah, and I don't often agree with much in that yeah. paper. But, but, but I, you know, I think... I've often said this because, Raymond, you and I know people in the Curia. We've known them for years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good, hardworking, serious mm -hmm. people there uh, who are admirable. And the way to reform the Curia is to have people there who are good people. Right. Uh, and whatever, however you structure it, unless you've got the good people that are in the structure, you're not going to reform anything. And, of mm -hmm. course, e evangelization is, is the purpose of the church. But the point is, someone who opens the mail at the CDF or someone who is filing there, that person is not on the street preaching, but that person is contributing to evangelization by helping yeah. those who are out yeah. in the field. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, it's structure over personnel, and that may be a misplaced uh, sense of reform. I've got to get your reaction to this. I, I saw this. Some, so many people sent this to me. It was floating online. This is a, a priest, and we don't know where he is. But it appears to be an Easter service, and he's sprinkling holy water over the congregation. But it looks more like a comedy routine. I mean, he's literally pouring water on people, and they're all laughing about it and yucking it up. Your reaction to this video? Raymond, uh, Asperger's is a wonderful thing, especially in an Easter vigil. Mm -hmm. uh, but that just shows how a good thing can be taken too far. Listen to the soundtrack there. People are gigging, they're laughing, they're clapping. That's not the reverence you want to have. Yes, joy at the resurrection. I was the Easter vigil with Bishop Bosch in Santa Rosa. Yeah. I mean, 
beautiful. Homily was wonderful. The service was beautiful. And the choir was absolutely angelic. I was weeping. Well, there was joy there. But, yeah. you know, it was joy within reverence. And so when you lose the reverence, then the whole purpose of the, you know, the service, it seems to me, is lost. I agree. I agree. No, it looked like Rip Taylor, you know, walking through the, one of those talk shows in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Father Fessio, for right, being thanks, here. Raymond. You can find out the latest offerings from Ignatius Press at Ignatius.com. Thank you.